Hello, welcome to Thursday Garden Chat, which is the weekly free broadcast run by Garden Masterclass. Our normal business is putting on day workshops led by garden and landscape experts across Great Britain and Ireland, and increasingly on the European mainland as well. Since the pandemic, however, we have gone global. We have started doing online broadcasts. Uh, a lot of these are pay-to-view webinars, which we do with uh, garden and landscape experts from all over the world to our global audience. However, this event is our Thursday Garden Chat, which is a pro bono. It's a free event, which we put on every Thursday for an hour with somebody who is a gardener. It could be a head gardener, a botanist, um, a, a garden historian, a photographer, a designer, a huge range of, of people we talk to. And these are recorded and they go up on our YouTube channel uh, and we keep them there for a couple of months. Uh, the best content then goes to our members channel. But at any one time, we've got something up to 100 hours of free, really interesting garden viewing on YouTube. Now, we do this for free and we would really appreciate donations to help with our running costs and you can do this with the donate button which you can find on the online page of our website watching anyway tonight we are in northern california which I would love to be at this very moment in time. <laughs> it would be wonderful. Um, so yeah, we are in Northern California in the morning um, and we're, we are going to be chatting to Jennifer Jewell. And Jennifer is a writer and a educator and a gardener. Um, and I'm not sure in quite which order or do we need an order? We Perhaps we don't even, we don't even need, a, need an order. And Jennifer's gonna be talking about herself and her work and her backgrounds and what she does. And we're also going to be focusing on Jennifer's amazing book, The Earth in Her Hands, which is about 75 extraordinary women working in the world of plants, which is it's the most beautiful book. I'm sure lots of you have, have got it. So welcome, Jennifer. It's really nice to have you here with us. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I was thinking this morning um, that my maternal grandfather came over to the US from Britain during World War II. And he used to tell this great story of growing up in Melton Mowbray and oh. stealing his grand his mother's high heel shoes to go into the field next door to steal potatoes. <laughs> and um, so I think he would be pretty tickled that I am speaking with you all today. <laughs> and were the high heel shoes being worn, or was he was he stabbing potatoes with them? I mean, what? Was no, the he they were being worn uh, so that uh, he and his brother's feet were not distinguishable. Right, right, extraordinary. Yeah, um, so. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's fantastic. And what I, what I also forgot to mention is that you are also an award-winning broadcaster and you have a, a weekly podcast. Is that right? Is it? A I do. Yes. Yeah, I have a, a, yeah, yeah, I have a weekly uh, public radio program, which uh -huh. became a podcast uh, about four years ago, five right. years ago. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So are, are you, um, as part of your talk, are, we, are you going to sort of talk a little bit about your background or should we have yeah. a little... Yeah, you are. So we, we, we're yeah. going to, that's going to be covered. So I don't need to. So sure. And then if you want to, so maybe I'll do the little introductory spiel uh, and then yeah. I'll pop off and you can ask me any questions you want. Um, and yeah, that's great. great. And of course, anybody listening, anybody watching, um, if you've got questions for Jennifer, then please pop them into the, into yeah. the chat box or you know you can do a wavy hand or something like that but um yeah that would be really good so yes if you'd like to go into screen share then we can sure. we can have us we can start thank you all right so this uh is a collage of women from uh the book the earth in her hands um and i put them up here because they really represent a great um like the multiplicity of what i love about gardening in any aspect, uh, not just in the book and not just on the podcast, but in my, my life in general. And um, to get to your question about the order in which these things happened in my life and, and the importance of them, Annie, I would say that th this, I love to start with the caveats and that is, I am not, uh, I am not a sociologist. I am not a scientist. I am not a, a you know, published researcher. 
I am first and foremost a gardener and I am not a fancy gardener or a famous gardener or a big gardener. I am just a really heartfelt home gardener. And I was raised by a, a professional gardening mother and a wildlife biologist father. And as I grew up in my own life and you know went off to work and always gardened and always gardened, I started to bring um, writing. I, I did. Uh, I studied English literature at Harvard University, and then I went on to work for Microsoft and uh, wrote articles for their Encarta Encyclopedia in the arts and literature uh, section. And um, but I started to bring writing and gardening together when I suggested we add to the encyclopedia some of the great gardens of the world, and. Uh, what was interesting is as this happened, um, I also started to have babies and then I moved to England for two years and w for my, at the time, husband's um, studies in medicine and we were in Bristol for two years and I had one baby girl and I was pregnant with my second baby girl and I had no working papers, but I had family all over the country and I just took that opportunity to uh, drive our little car and my little girl all around and I got my first gardening job uh, working in my godmother's garden um, at Budley Salterton and then uh, that's when I started to write for for magazines and I wrote for Gardens Illustrated and then we came back to the U.S. and one of the things that became apparent to me both as a mother and as a gardener and and as a person who loved sort of, you know, the, the idea of what we were seeing in magazines. As the writer contributing to glossy magazines, I started to get more and more uncomfortable with um, the idea of what we were seeing versus how I experienced gardening myself or how my gardening friends experienced gardening. And so uh, when we moved to Northern California in 2007, I started a public radio program and essentially stopped writing for glossy magazines. Not that I, I don't love some of them, and I think they have gone a long way since 2007 in recalibrating what they put out there as valuable. But I, when I moved to Northern California and I thought to myself, and this this the sort of catalyst for this was when an editor at a magazine said to me, well, we can't publish that because that man looks dirty and he's wearing a t-shirt, uh, like a ripped t-shirt or a dirty t-shirt or something. And, and I, I really, I, I struggled with what I was contributing to. And so I, when I moved to Northern California, I said public radio is where I wanna be because public radio, you get to talk about gardening, but you don't have to look at gardening. And that allows you to transcend um, this sort of two-dimensional restriction that, that I was really struggling with at the time. And so in 2016, that public radio program became Cultivating Place, uh, which is uh, conversations on natural history and the human impulse to garden. And you will see in there the, the marriage between my mother and my father, uh, one being a non-college educated, hardworking plants woman in the dirt you know, like my earliest memories are under the potting table at the birthed greenhouse in Colorado with women's voices all around me. And, um, and then my father's real love of an immersion in um, the, the Western academic scientific study of plants and animals in ecosystems together. And my parents, um, and I think this will be sort of interesting to some of you, my parents and all of my extended family were in the Northeast uh, or in England. And when my, they were pregnant with me, my mother and father made the move across the United States to uh, Loveland, Fort Collins, Colorado for my father to do his PhD in wildlife biology. And my father and mother like really experienced this epiphany of how different the West was and how not just ecologically and in you know physical environment but in cultural environment as well and my and and while they love the East and all and I spend a lot of time going back East there was this different sense of of culture in the West that they really loved and I've been in the West ever since. And so 
when I started this program and it grew up into this one hour weekly program that was globally focused, I really wanted to focus on not just how to garden, but why we garden. I wanted to talk more about uh, what our gardens feel like and what they mean to us and our larger culture rather than just what they look like or how to do it. There is so much good how-to information out there and it's only gotten better and more in these last five, 10 years. Um, and, but I think there has been less of the conversation about why and what does it mean. And, and one of the points I will make is that I, I think that in England, you know, there is this general sense of gardening is a part of most households. But in, in the U.S., you maybe get a little bit less of this sense. That said, in the last census, 38% of all households in the United States identified as engaging in gardening in some capacity. And that represents 49 million households, which is a pretty big cohort of people. And I firmly believe, based on my upbringing and my own life experience, that gardens and gardening are these powerful intersectional agents and spaces for potential change in our world. And I say potential because one of the things that's clear to me is that of those 49 million households, only a fifth of them are organic gardeners. Only, um, and, and that's not even, that, that doesn't even include a rating for a habitat gardener or a community gardener or a social justice gardener. And I am very interested in those places where our gardens interface and, and horticulture generally interfaces with these bigger, constructs in our world and becomes a contributing factor to them, not just a decorative accessory to them. And, and, and I'm talking about, you know, a, economy, I'm talking about environment, I'm talking about academics, I'm talking about uh, equity, all of these things and how gardening and horticulture interface with them. So that was the point of, of the radio program, and it remains the point. I think my single goal in everything I speak on the radio or on the podcast or in my writing is to elevate the way we think and talk about gardening, especially in the U.S., because I think it's, far, it's for far too long and even now been um, easily dismissed or diminished as something that's very pretty but not particularly necessary uh, that, you know, it, it, it could even be a little pragmatic, but you're not going to grow all your food there. So what's, you know, what's the big deal? And it's been far too long, especially visually dominated by this idea that only a certain kind of person gardens. Um, and, uh, and again, it's sort of a dilettante hobby of a thing. And um, I think we can do a whole lot better than that. So wait, I forgot this. So in 2017, Timber Press, one of the Hort Presses here in the US came to me and asked me if I'd be interested in writing a book on women in horticulture. And I said I would be as long as they understood the lens that I was gonna be looking at uh, this idea through. And by that, I mean very specifically that I was going to be writing about women who in my perception and study were doing things in horticulture that expanded the field, that made us think about gardening differently or more expansively uh, or, um, or better in, in some ways. And, and not just horticulturally, but the way that horticulture intersects with these other fields. Now, without question, anyone's going to look at this book and say, I can't believe you didn't include this woman. Like, how did you not get her? And the, the fact is that, you know, I had less than a year, I had no travel budget, and I was never, never intending to write an exhaustive or definitive tome on all of the great women in horticulture. Uh, I, I wanted to write a list that was suggestive, and that was suggestive of where some of these women were opening our horticultural eyes and hearts and impacts. And so 
you know, there are women in the audience, any among them, who could easily be in this book. There are plants women who could easily be in the, in the book, especially in England. This, that was one of the greatest struggles. But I had to narrow it down, and boundaries and constraints are a good thing. Um, and so we came up with 75. And the first thing that I did was to try to determine for myself, based on my 10 years in, uh, in broadcasting and, and interviewing and writing to some extent, like where were interesting things happening in the horticultural world or the fields of expertise that inform what we think of as horticulture. And these were the fields that I came up with. Again, there could be other fields added here, uh, art, actual physical art is one of the fields that I can think of that I would maybe add now, but I, you know, I had, again, constraints. So these were the fields and, you know, and there was for me as a 55 year old college educated woman in the United States in 2018, when I was doing this, there, there was a little bit of discomfort of actually about only writing about women. And I come from a strongly female dominated family. I, I am all about the matriarchy if you talk to me for any length of time, but I recognize that there is something sexist about only writing about women in a world that needs less sexism rather than more sexism. But for me, it did become very clear that one, it was the job I was asked to do, but two, it was a very still very much needed uh, discussion about representation. So I came up with these fields and then I said, okay, who do I want to populate these fields? Who are the women that are doing interesting things in these, these areas? And I was really striving, um, you know, and this was 2017, 2018 that I was starting to work on this, really striving to include a great diversity of women. And when I say diversity, I mean of age, of physical location, of background, of orientation, and of expertise. So, you know, in each of these, there were about five to seven women. The youngest woman in the cohort was 26 when I interviewed her. The two elders were in their 80s, uh, still are. And the, uh, and there's just a, a great representation. I stuck primarily to the English speaking world because I don't speak any other language except for very little French, which isn't useful to me um, or anyone. And I also, um, again, constraints. So it is highly dominated by women from the US and the UK. And then we have women in Australia and Canada and Ireland and Japan and India. And as I was starting to fill out these names, a couple of things became clear to me. One is that, you know, a couple of these fields have long been dominated by women, floral design and floriculture among them, um, garden writing also firmly uh, inhabited by women. And some of them have not long been inhabited by women, but almost all of the fields have not been long dominated by women who are sitting in decision-making positions at the highest levels. And that is what I found interesting. And so, you know, I think especially in this last year, two years, we've been hearing a lot about this sort of idea that representation matters. And so it sounds a little glib, it sounds a little bit like a sound bite, but I will tell you that in my experience of this, and again, these are not statistically significant numbers. I am not a social scientist, but this is my, observation and I stand by it that representation in these fields matters and when you put one woman even one woman let alone a woman of color or a very young woman or a much older woman in a decision making position in one of these fields you begin to change what career access looks like and when you change what career access looks like you also change what experiential diversity is sitting at those decision making tables making decisions. And that could be that they had to, you know, accommodate taking care of their children while they were building their career. It could be that they had to accommodate one of their, their elders in their family and care for them while they were building their career. It could be that they were in a powerfully underserved environment or neighborhood, and that changed their experiential diversity. Those differences in experiential diversity at a decision-making table changed the values and priorities with which decisions were being made. 
when you change those two things, you change what leadership looks like. And when you change what leadership looks like, you actually start to make an impact in the broader community and, and cultures of our whole world, let alone you know Northern California or all of the US or whatever, you actually stand a chance of changing individual and communal health and well-being. You change environmental health and well-being and economic and cultural norms, social justice, and what I like to call cultural literacy. Because I think especially in the US, there is this sense of what cultural literacy includes. And in the last 20, 30 years, it has not included horticulture and gardening. And I think that is a big mistake. And we are paying for that mistake uh, quite, um, painfully right now. So this, this was sort of the background that I was bringing to the earth in her hands. And um, that is um, that is where I'll stop for right now so that you can ask me a couple questions and I can stop sharing. Would that be better so that you see? Well, I, I think if, if you leave this up, it's fine, actually. But right. I'm, I'm slightly intrigued by the number 75. Is that is that Ooh. purely number of pages, numbers of words per person filling a book of a certain, I mean, is that a, is that a publisher's number that, or why was, yeah, where did 75 and not 100 <laughs> or 50? <laughs> well, first I had to read my tarot cards. Then, no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, it is absolutely just pragmatic. It, we started at, I, I started saying, I want to do 100 because that's a good round number. Yeah. And, um, and then as the scope of the work started to make itself clear, there was just no way I was going to get to 100 and meet my deadline at all. And so we settled on 75 because that's what I thought I could accomplish mm -hmm. um, in the amount of time I had. Um, as it was, I missed my deadline by about a month because right as my deadline came upon me, we had the campfire in 2018 here and our neighboring town burnt to the ground, as you might remember. Oh, and, um, and I was evacuated and, um, but my house was fine and I was very lucky. So, uh, so I missed my, I missed my deadline, but, um, but I, I turned it in eventually. So yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. And so, um, yeah, the, the choice of women, I mean, it, it, I know that you're going to talk about some of them in particular, but what I think is extraordinary about it is, is, is that wonderful range of women and, I was interested that you say you didn't have a travel budget because I don't get the I get the sense that you went to see every single one of them and sat down with them and and talked over a table. You know what I mean? I, I get the yes. and that was one thing I was going to ask you. Obviously, I, I, I don't I didn't assume you were going to fly to Japan or to England or whatever, but I got the feeling that you had, you know, this this rapport. We, we learn so much about the people and. I also feel that you are you're a people person. Actually, I feel my feeling is that you're as interested in the person and the people and, and where they come from than the subject of the gardening in a way. I mean, it's kind of where yes. are they from? Yeah. yeah. Which, which is which is so which is wonderful. Um, and and I, I don't want to give away, give everything away. But I th also what I really loved about it is at the end of each section on each person, you ask each person for their uh, you know, um, influent key influential women in their life. So there's this wonderful sort of leading you through from this person that you, that I certainly haven't heard of most of the women in this book, you know, and, and you're learning about them and then you're learning about the women that inspire them. And that's fantastic because there's this open-endedness of, oh, I've yeah. got to go and, I've got to go and Google that woman. Yeah. <laughs> it was that, that was, I think, um, really that, that, quelled my sadness at just having 75 mm. uh, because it allowed for this great network. And it also modeled something that, again, a little, you know, could sound a little cliche about women in our world today, but there is this absolute sense of community and networking that, um, that allows them to thrive and that, that connects them across time. And so I would ask each one, you know, is there someone I'm missing that you think I should include or, but then I was able to also include these other women and therefore it became this much bigger community of voices that you, you found yourself sitting with. And I will say that, you know, I, I am in love with every single one of these women. Like when I was speaking with, and it was an extensive interview 
process because I didn't, I wasn't able to visit them in person. So, you know, I had them write to me. I wrote back and forth with them. We then spoke on the phone or over Zoom or, um, you know, over FaceTime. And then I would write again and then I would send it to them and then we would work more. Um, and, and that taught me a ton of lessons. Uh, there was at least one woman who, you know, I was, it was the youngest woman in the book and I, I was so excited and I wrote up her essay and I sent it off to her all proud of myself with the research I'd done. And she wrote back and was like, that is not what I meant at all. Oh, no. <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, let's start again. Let's uh -huh. teach, teach Jennifer how, how to learn more. And that's good. Wow. Wow. It's amazing. So, so um, forgive me if you've already said this, but from beginning to end, how long was the process um, of, of the book from? Well, it was about, um, let's see, 12, it was about 16 months total. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and the, the point of. No, it was actually probably with the, 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 the copy edits and the captioning, which come after you turn it in, it was probably closer to 19 months. Okay. Okay. And, and, the, <clears throat> and the narrowing down the 75 women, the two, was that, that's part of that period of time or did that take? Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. that, that was part of that time. And so some of the parameters included, um, and, and we, we struck on this as a way to narrow down, they had to be living. Yeah. And they had to be, their work had to have come to the fore in the last 25 years. So oh. from the turn of the century, okay. so that who I was writing about were really like shaping things that we are seeing come to fruition right now. They were, they were dealing with very current trends and it was, it was sad to do that. I mean, there were right before I, I, you know, finalized my list, a couple, two women died. Oh. And so I could not include them. And that was, that was, that was hard. Mm -hmm. um, and some people's work who is very in, uh, you know, kind of foundational to our period in time, who's, so Beth Chatto was one of the women who died and, oh, right. and um, Ruth Bancroft here in uh, California also died. So, but several of the women, their work was really foundational to what we understand about women in horticulture right now, but they hadn't really done much since say like the eighties or the nineties. And so I kind of had to skip that, which again, like leaves this kind of gap in information, but that was, those were the parameters. Yeah. And those parameters, were they ones that you set, Jennifer, or was it, or was it a discussion with you in Timber Press? So was it, was that? It was a little bit of a back and forth, but it was my final choice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Do you, do you want to carry on a little bit? Uh, more? We, have we, um, we've got a comment and a question. Actually, the question oh, yep. does pick up on something you said. So would you mind if we? Oh, well, no, no, go to it. Wait, no, why can't I see all, this? Sam, first of all, Saman in Oakland, California, um, a beginner designer, pregnant with my first child, and you're speaking to me and giving me hope for the impact of my work in the future, which is lovely. Yay! Um, and then a question from Jeanette Cole. Um, mm -hmm. Please give us an example of leadership and policy where a woman in place has made a difference. Oh, um, that's coming. Maybe in the gardening world. <laughs> well, um, I, I mean, I can give you a couple of examples, um, especially from the book, but I, and, and I will talk about a couple yeah. of the women who, mm -hmm. who taught me or, or showed me, or from whose work I derived some of these larger implications or mm -hmm. ramifications. But um, I will give you an example. Can you, I can't, for whatever reason, I can't see the chat. That's okay. Could you tell me the name of the person that asked me that question? Um, it comes up as iPad Jeanette Cole. Oh, Jeanette. Okay. So Jeanette, um, if you were to look in this book, you will read about a woman named Mary Pat Matheson, who is the uh, president and CEO of the Atlanta Botanical Garden in Atlanta, Georgia. She is a, a white woman who came to this garden from, uh, from Red Butte Garden in Salt Lake City, Utah. She came to the Atlanta Botanical Garden and it was immediately obvious to her. And I want to say she, she went to the garden in like 2000 and 11 maybe she became the director it became immediately obvious to her that this garden was in decline it was losing membership it was losing funding and that the members they did have and the outreach they did do was absolutely not serving the actual demographics of that city of atlanta georgia and 
she put her thinking cap on and she realized that she could not solve this problem with just one kind of uh, avenue to address it. She had to actually look at the entire structure of the garden and address this not meeting the demographics of her city from every single level of the garden, from who was working on the grounds crew to who were the schools coming to visit to who were the volunteers engaged in that garden to who were the staff working in that garden to who was able to actually get access to the garden. And she then put herself in partnership with uh, multiple agencies across the state of Georgia, including the historic black colleges of that whole region of the Southeast with the city of Atlanta, with the public school system of Atlanta. And then she got grants from different nonprofits in order to fund a five-year program in which every single public servant in that city received a free membership to the, to the garden for five years. And at the sort of last two years of that five year period, that membership started to go up a little, like, so it wasn't free any longer. It was like $10 and then it was $15. And she, because when this very multi uh, cultural city, when you gave free membership to every public servant, that meant every police officer, every firefighter, every teacher, every nurse in a public hospital, every bus driver, you got a very dem different demographic coming to the garden. But because she also was addressing this by who was working there and who was on the grounds crew and who were the volunteers and who were the docents and who were the, you know, intern student researchers, when those people arrived at the garden, they saw a demographic that looked much more representative of the demographic of the city, not just the wealthy white elite that had been making up that demographic before. So she addressed not just the problem of membership at the garden, but that the garden became this relevant living institution in this city. And it created this kind of feeder supply of young horticulturalists coming up in, in the school system. And she created this job sort of flow and pipeline from the colleges and the research students who would then be able to take advantage of the garden and go on to then populate these positions of leadership that were not being filled by a representative demographic. And it was genius. And it wasn't, you know, she, she had the idea and she had the will but she also put herself in partnership across these spheres and it completely changed what the Atlantic, uh, Atlanta Botanical Garden is doing. And I think she is a role model for many, many of our public gardens right now um, and, uh, and for good reason. So I hope that answers your question to some extent. Just said thank you. That was an amazing uh, response. And and I think, you know, isn't it amazing that actually it just takes something very simple. I mean, that in, in essence, that's a very simple idea. It's almost yeah. like it's so blatantly obvious. Why don't you do that? And yet, you know, it, it, it doesn't get done. But no, fantastic. And I, th I think a lot of our, you know, a lot of our horticultural societies and gardens uh, of, have been fairly entrenched with one way of doing things. And sometimes it takes an outsider or a year like 2020 for people to go, wait a minute, we're, why are we in this box? What is this box? And how can we think ourselves out of this box for the better for everybody? Um, and so, yeah. There you go. And you can tell I don't get at all passionate about these things in my responses. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> With my hands and yeah. yeah um, no. So, and there, you know, uh, would you like me to share these couple of other? Yeah, let's, let's move on. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. And it's, it's, it is dificult because I would be happy to sit here for, with you for the next three days to talk about every single one of these women, but I think you might have other things to do. So um, Annie asked me to, to sort of handpick a couple of the women that I really enjoyed and whose work expanded my own thinking while I was in this process. And, and I don't know if you remember 2018, um, wherever you might be living, but 2017 and 2018 were were pretty 
um, depressing years, depressing years in politics, in environmental chaos and reports coming out in, in, in a lot of ways. And so to be sitting and in just immersed in the women and the work that they were doing gave me an enormous, enormous amount of hope um, and belief that there is just a lot of agency in, in what we each can do from our own gardens. So this is Tiffany Freeman and she is a uh, traditional med medicine practitioner in Calgary, Canada. She is, I have a couple of notes so I don't get it wrong. She's a clinical herbalist and she is certified in traditional Chinese medicine as a doctor in traditional Chinese medicine. She is a certified clinical herbalist as certified by the North American Herbalist Association. And she is also of Cree descent. And one of the things that this, the, uh, the herbalism uh, thread through the book was one that was really interesting to me because I have been seeing this last five, 10 years, a real resurgence in, in people um, exploring herbalism, in people exploring uh, being proactive with their own health care, and how we start to see health care, advocating strongly that we start to see health care not as what happens when we go to the doctor because we're sick, but rather in the preventative way in which we care for ourselves through our food, through our habits, before we go to the doctor. That healthcare is actually taking care of ourselves before we get sick. What happens after we get sick isn't healthcare so much as it is sick care. And, um, and that's, a, that's a really interesting, um, especially I would say in the US, a really interesting um, and rising field and, and way of thinking in, in our world. And what I love about what uh, Tiffany is doing is that she is bringing together three really strong traditions in herbal thinking and study and putting them together with a Western academic mindset uh, that makes it all four of them stronger and better and more informed. So she pulls her Cree uh, traditional knowledge and her studies in traditional Chinese medicine and then her Western American version of herbalism together with uh, medical care in the US. And she founded something called the Lodge Pool School of Holistic Studies, which is particularly serving women's health care and children's health care uh, in terms of taking care of ourselves prior to being sick. Um, and this integration of fields of knowledge, some fields of knowledge, which I will say, you know, are, are, are largely dismissed in the US by our traditional academic medical fields. Uh, I think that is starting to change, uh, but I, I, certainly up until 2017 when I was doing this, it hadn't changed very much. Um, this is Fanula Fallon. Fanula is a, a longtime columnist for the Irish Times. She is an organic flower farmer and she is the founder of the uh, Irish Flower Farmer Association. No, Flower Farmers of Ireland is how you say it. And one of the things that I found interesting in researching the women that I was speaking with was the ways in which their physical spaces or their traditional cultures of their spaces were kind of growing up beyond uh, the colonialism of the, the dominance of the United Kingdom and sort of growing up past this hegemony, for lack of a better word, of the English garden style. And, um, and, and one of the things that I, I then actually take this idea and am using it uh, as a lens in my second book, which publishes in a, in a little while, but is looking at what are the, the drawbacks and what the drawbacks and um, damage that has been done by having this one idea of what a garden should look like or what beautiful is um, shown to us over and over and over again over generations now. 
and, 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 and what are some of the negative fallouts of that one ideal? And what I love about some of what Fanula is doing is real, and she has written a book called From the, and I think she did it with her photographer husband, um, it's called From the Ground Up, How Ireland is Growing Its Own. And it's really embracing gardens that are uh, specifically rooted in their exact spaces and physical places in Ireland, traditional methods, and a lot of the native plants of Ireland um, and then putting them out into the Irish times, which starts to then change, again, the standard of what is expected and what is beautiful and who is to say what that is. But every time we get a, a picture, every time an Irish garden gets a picture of Irish native plants as opposed to English native plants or American native plants, and that triangle can go in all directions, right? Um, you start to change start to change what people then think is expected or 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 beautiful or accessible and and to me that's a really interesting conversation that's Fanula, and i just love to say her name um this is marina christopher i'm sure a lot of you know of marina christopher um and again there are so many plants women that i can think of that should be in the book and that could be in the book Derry watkins is one of the first ones that comes to mind and the um, but C Marina Christopher is 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 the one that I sort of chose to represent this category. And Marina is um, a, a really interesting woman, a really uh, passionate and and knowledgeable plants woman. And she is the owner of Phoenix Perennial Plants. But what I found most intriguing and um, educational, illustrative, illuminative about what she does is that. Her focus on hand observe, like first of all, observing plants in the wild and studying them, collecting them, trialing them, then introducing them um, in a variety of ways through catalogs, through uh, garden nurseries, and through garden and flower shows represents this supply chain that is often invisible to us as gardeners because we go to the nursery and we are like oh i think that's really pretty i think i'll buy that it's in bloom great taking it home behind that plant that we just sort of thought was lovely in the in the nursery center or that we might see in a garden design at a flower show is somebody who actually decided to use that plant behind that somebody sarah price you know uh, Arabella Lennox, uh, Boyd, behind that person is the, the nursery woman or, or man who decided to actually use that plant, give it to the designer, and then put it in the, the show garden. So I think, especially in our world right now, where, again, there is this disconnect between what we as gardeners understand is happening in the world and our love of gardening, this is an important supply chain for us to make visible because uh, too often now we have a supply chain that doesn't look anything like this. And it doesn't have anything like the, the time and the knowledge and the ethics in how it is being put to the end result of a plant in our nursery. Um, and there are, you know, our plants are being grown by tissue culture and or with, you know, heavy, uh, synthetic and non-organic fertilizers and pesticides and fungicides, and that is causing chaos in ways that we don't know. And, and I'm, I am not a huge fan of uh, GMOs, and I am not a, few, a huge fan of tissue culture, and I'm not saying they should be banned altogether, but I am saying that as gardeners, we need to be a lot more cognizant and educated about where our plants come from and how they're being grown if we do not want to be complicit in the destruction of people and places around the world through the love of our gardens. I think that is, that is a, a connectivity that we fail to see, and um, and that as gardeners, that is not who we want to be. Again, me getting really passionate. Uh, one example of this, which I, I loved her story, and she's really, like, she's this very petite woman um, of Filipino descent, and she's very funny about that, like how she can crouch to weed in a way that other people can't. Uh, it's her description. And 
but she was talking about introducing like studying plants specifically for their pollinator benefit uh you know having somebody come to her and say i would like to design a garden for chelsea in three years from now i want it to look like this and you know one of the plants that then took off was beth's poppy uh that she introduced it showed at a garden and then it became an enormous success in the industry and, and I just, I think that's a, a fun supply chain that we as gardeners should know more about. Erin Benzikane is a name you probably all know. She is the uh, Floret Flower Farm founder and visionary. And she is, she is an empire builder of uh, incredible reach. She is also, however, a, a very um, modest and reserved woman. And she works very, very hard to do what she does. Now, this is an interesting element. The, the floriculture one is, is again, one of, one of the fields that's been long inhabited by women. Um, and I had to really think long and hard about the, the larger impacts of this field in our world. And I, I kept coming back to uh, an essay by Eleanor Perini in her book, uh, Green Thoughts. And it's an essay called Woman's Place. And in that, she posits this really interesting theory, a little bit tongue in cheek, um, but that basically at some point, um, the Western white men of the world got together uh, towards you know, the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s and said, you know what, we're gonna keep women out of the universities. We're gonna keep them out of the professional fields, but we're gonna give them the flower garden. We're just gonna keep them in the flower garden. They're gonna be happy and it's gonna look really pretty too. And so that in essence, she was kind of joking, but there's some, some truth here that it would be this gilded cage in which women would be contained and not muck everything up. And so, um, but one of the things that I found so enheartening and, and great was again, floriculture is often dismissed as a very pretty part of our industry, but not very, you know, not very powerful. The likes of Erin Benzikane or Fanula Fallon with her flower growing or Deborah Princing with the Slow Flowers Society um, or some of the bigger uh, flower designers is that they have taken the floral world and again they have recognized several gaps that make no sense in environment or in economics and they have become economic and environmental drivers in our world and i think they have powerful lessons for us so aaron was a young mom and really interested in being a floral designer uh, she was trying to juggle being a mom and this career she realized that the flowers that were available to her were not the flowers she wanted to work with she was struggling to make time with her kids and to get this flower business off the ground um, she had this sort of epiphany moment where she didn't have any flowers that she'd gotten from a supplier uh, and so she picked sweet peas from her garden. She took them to a client. The client accepted the sweet peas and burst into tears. And she had this moment of like, oh wait, I should grow my own flowers. And you know, in, and this was in 2008 that she then and her husband started the very seedling sized version of what is Floret Flower Farm now. And once she started to grow her own and easily landed a big contract with Whole Foods to have these organic flowers, she thought other people want to know how to grow their own organic flowers too. And so she started teaching workshops to people across, from across the country. They would come to her farm and learn how to start their own organic flower farms that would either supply their own floral design or supply floral designers or flower shops in their towns and um and and what happened is that she started this small flower farm basically revolution across the u.s that has gone on to impact you know the english flower farms the irish flower farms the australian flower farms and they have changed what was a billion multi-billion dollar industry that was largely import export in the u.s so flowers being flown from far, far away by people and in places where they had far less rigorous environmental uh, restrictions than we have. And again, you get that complicit behavior because almost everybody buys flowers at some point in the year and sometimes a lot more than just one time in the year. And her work 
single-handedly almost brought that industry back to the U.S., made it micro economies across the country, and allowed people who were looking for flexible and meaningful work to, to do this in small and flexible ways with their kids, with their elders, with their community, around their other job that was earning enough money until this got um, you know, off the ground. So an economic driver of remarkable means. It has grown since then to be three books and a seed company um, and continues to be a, a leading voice in, in our world of flowers and small businesses and environmentally and economically sustainable. And then the, the last person I wanna introduce you to is Yolanda Burrell, who is the founder of something called Pollinate Farm and Garden in Oakland, California. Now, since I wrote the book uh, and in the wake of 2020, Yolanda's uh, brick and mortar building has closed, but she is still online. But I, I introduce you to Yolanda because she, really illuminated for me something that I hadn't seen before. And that was this, um, again, it's sort of about the supply chain, but the ways in which we get our garden knowledge, our plants, our tools, our equipment. And um, so she was born and raised in the, the Central Valley of California to farming and gardening family. Uh, she went off to study computer science and consult uh, with companies. She moved to Oakland with her husband and, uh, but was always an avid gardener and like a, an avid sort of homesteader kind of gardener. She wanted to grow food. She wanted to have chickens. She was involved as in her sort of off work time in a lot of groups about urban agriculture. And what she realized is that there was no place within uh, like a, I think a 50 minute drive of her for her to get soil or seeds or a watering can or shade cloth or chicken food. And so, you know, there's other people in the book that talk about sort of food apartheid and access to fresh local food. But what she was experiencing was garden education and garden supply uh, desert. If, if you will, desertification. And so she started in, in a moment in time when most garden supply is consolidating into our big box stores and becoming smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of what the options are on the shelf. Yolanda, along with several other nursery women in the book, decided to actually open a very local food and grain, you know, feed and grain and garden supply store in Oakland, California. And she decided that it needed to have classes on everything from chicks to seeds to cooking with your food. And uh, it became this enormous success in her town of Oakland because it gave access where there had been none. And in giving that access, it lit a fire of interest and um, young people coming up being able to do these things. And one of the things she says about her work and in, in her farm shop is that, you know, she's not teaching anybody to do anything. She is reminding them of something that is in their DNA somewhere whether it's one generation back or six generations back, we all have land-based uh, and growing genes in our bloodstreams. So it is a remembering of what we're doing. And um, I just, I, I feel like the ne these niches that are finding resonance and audience uh, are feeding the hunger that we often don't even know we have, um, but that we as established gardeners can help bridge these gaps in the way that these, these women have been doing. And I think that's my last, that's her too. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And that's-, that's Yeah, and we'll, we, we'll, we'll talk about this Im image in a second. Yeah, we'll but, go back to your one. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm- I don't even know what time it is. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so pleased that you chose Marina um, because I, I know her very well and she's a wonderful woman. And 
She is the most knowledgeable woman horticulturalist that I know personally, and and her knowledge is scary. I mean, I just feel like my fingernail, you know, it, I know it's just like she just mm-hmm. is so knowledgeable and so generous with that knowledge, and uh, and she's just wonderful. So I'm so pleased she was in the book, and and I'm sure she'd be really touched that we're talking about her tonight as well because she's so self-effacing. There are two, a couple of, well, two or three women I'd like to just touch on very briefly because yeah. I, I mean, the thing with your book is that every single woman in there is just fascinating. And, and you know, we could do a series of, of these talks and we'd get through the book in about four years. Um, but um, Leslie Bennett, I'd like to start with, who, who and, and extraordinary because she's a career changer. And, and as I'm involved in garden design and a lot of teaching, I do get a lot of career change people come along. But she's quite extraordinary in the fact that she... <laughs> she was a heart she went to Harvard and then she came to London and she studied law um and then she and then she changed career Uh, um so could could you just expand a tiny bit on Leslie because I think her story is is wonderful absolutely wonderful So she, yeah, she is a fascinating woman. Um, Her father is Jamaican and her mother is English, a a black father and a white mother. And um, she studied, as you say, she studied law, but she very specifically studied environmental and cultural uh, landscape kind of law. Um, And she was in London, getting her, I, I think, third uh, professional legal degree of some variety, um, when somebody asked her, because she was, you know, talking about this environmental and, and cultural landscape law, and someone said to her, like, have you ever actually been on the land at all? And she said, mm, not, not so much. And they said, you should really get out and volunteer. And so she started volunteering for uh, this land-based, uh, she was a woofer on a, on a couple of different farms in the UK. Um, and she all of a sudden realized that what she really wanted to be doing was, was actually being engaged with land and with plants and with growing. And this morphed a couple of times. She came back to the US, she started a landscape design business And she quickly began to focus on edible garden design and sort of like making edible landscapes beautiful and aesthetic, uh, but really pragmatic as well. So that the vegetable garden wasn't relegated to three raised beds in the back garden, um, but that the edible garden was throughout a landscape design. But she also started to realize, especially as a Black woman in the U.S., that these the the cultural landscape was part of this that it was important for people especially her i mean you know it's sort of the revelation started with her and then to radiate out that it was important for her to pass on to her children this idea that uh they knew what plants their father's culture had that were important and that they knew what plants her their grandmothers uh, and their mother's cultures had as important. And she wanted them to understand that there was great story and power and strength in, and, and integrity in all of these stories. And, and then it became clear to her that, you know, that again, like as a black woman working as a landscape designer in Oakland, California, that there was a great, dearth of of gardening not uh, of of the visual or like the images of of black people gardening or asian people gardening or you know what this meant to those people and that as a landscape designer she was often designing gardens specifically for people who had the money to to get a garden and in oakland california Ooh, we seem to have. Oh, I thought it was me that had frozen. No, it was, Jen, it Jen, Jen is frozen. Oh, okay, okay. Um, um, how odd. Yeah, that I they maybe. Oh, there we go. Um, Jen, you're back. Oh, did I go away? Yeah, no, I, 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 you're back. I'm so sorry. 
um, I don't know where I ended. Um, yeah. I, I, no, I, well, I, I, when I was just answering somebody who was asking who's, who, who is the woman we're talking about, and it's Leslie Bennett, somebody very kindly. Yes. That. So I, right. I thought it was me that had frozen, but um, okay. So as, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, no, that's okay. Um, as, and I'll just mention one more person, because I know that there's probably, people would like to ask questions, I'm sure. Um, Jamaica Kincaid. Now, if I was, I'm, I've always fantasized about going on, you know, um, plant hunting expeditions that, that are quite tame, I have to say. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go in, you know, the deepest, darkest places. But but if, if I was going to walk with one other person, you know, through the mountains and look for plants, I think I'd like to be with her. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about her? Because she just sounds amazing she is amazing and um okay so before while my connection is stable uh, yeah. i will just say that i have interviewed jamaica kincaid and leslie bennett and um leah peniman another one that you had asked me about and yeah. these are i think episodes that are well worth listening to if these these aspects of the horticultural world are of interest to you mm -hmm. so jamaica kincaid was one of the women that i absolutely knew i wanted in this book uh because in 1999, I believe, her, her book, she, she's mostly known as a, a scholar of African American literature and uh, uh, African liter the African diaspora of literature across the world. Uh, but she is also this avid gardener. And in 1995, she began writing a series of essays on gardens for the New Yorker. And she uh, was asked by the editor at the time to write them. And, and at the same time, the editor said, I know so many great gardens on Long Island that I, you're just going to love. <laughs> and Jamaica Kincaid was like, no, that is not how I'm going to write about gardening. That is not who I'm going to write about. I'm going to write about my experience of gardening. And these series of essays were compiled into this book called My Garden Book. And when I read this as a young mother in 1999, my head like just exploded with the ideas that she was bringing forward that I, I had never had pointed out to me before as a middle class, middle, you know, age white woman. And I, you know, she, she talks about how the garden brings the world to us and it brought the world to her better than any education. Um, and she's not, she does not, she did not graduate from college. She became a staff writer at the New Yorker uh, on her writing skills and her personality alone. She is now a, an African-American scholar at Harvard University. But this book, the first thing she does is she talks about how she became a gardener as an adult with young children. And she didn't even know she wanted to garden, but uh, her husband at the time and her first child at the age of one or whatever on her second mother's day gave her the gift of some seeds and a rake and a little wheelbarrow and a watering can. And she just went out into the garden, into the yard, the, the grassy yard, and she dug up some grass and she planted the seeds and she watered them everything died. She was a total failure at this first try, but she got the bug. And from then on, she just became an obsessive, happy gardener the way many of us are. I'm sure none of you understand that feeling. <laughs> and so she, but for every plant she would bring into her garden, she would study where it came from, what its name was, who, you know, how you took care of it, what its story was. So she learned about the dahlia and she learned about the peony and she kept coming across these names that were, you know, white men explorers, basically from the European world. And she kept, you know, sort of finding this colonial armature around the plants that she was loving. And, and she kept sort of having to ask herself, like, where am I in this story? What does this story mean to a black or brown girl like me? And it is, a, it is an interesting dilemma. And, and she talks as well about the fact that, you know, she came from Antigua to the U.S. She's now working for this, you know, U.S. publication. She, you know, is buying these plants and loves them, knows they come from somewhere else. So she is a part of this colonial acquisitive mindset just as, as much as almost anybody. And, but she kind of goes on to say, you know, that, Yes, the enslavement of peoples, the erasure of histories, the, the renaming of plants in order to own them and control them is part of the narrative. 
but you can also do better than that. You can learn that history and then learn that the Dahlia wasn't always called the Dahlia to everybody. It was actually original to South and Central America and was a ceremonial plant of these, this culture. And it has this other name. And that by doing that, by like going deeper with what we understand and know about our plants, we, we reclaim a sense of respect and interconnectedness that is beneficial to everybody. <clears throat> and it's, 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 it's powerful. Um, it's powerful conversation and mm. thinking, mm. Um, I think, especially, um, you know, and, and she talks about the, the irony of actually then going on a plant hunting trip with Dan Hinckley and, you know, going to these faraway places and collecting plants. And she traveled with Sue Wynn Jones on one of them and, um, uh, you know, and, and so she becomes in essence, the exact same person that she is talking about. And, and that is an interesting lens as well. Um, and it's, it's an expansive lens that I think betters all of us. Mm, mm, no, absolutely wonderful. Um, and I could go on for more, but I think we should, we should let people ask questions, but shall we, before we just sort of ask for questions, should we just talk about your next, just a quickie, a quick insight into your next. Next, yeah. coming soon coming soon to a cinema near you <laughs> um yes so this is under western skies which is your which is well you'll say here coming out in may 2021 so pretty much and i think maybe it's not coming out in the uk so for uk people uh i guess get on amazon sadly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, or or get to an independent bookstore and ask them if they'll order it. I'm not sure it's being if it it's got a release date in the UK, but it is about it is about gardens in the Western US, but it is absolutely about more and about the lessons we learn from from gardens and gardeners that are very connected to exactly where they are. And and one of the things I I, I have a when I talk about the book, I have a slide that shows a garden of high, you know, a picture from High Grove. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, when this is the ideal that is set up for us, and then I show a picture of kind of where I live in Northern California, which has gets no rain from May through October or November, I say, when this is the ideal and this is where you live, like what happens? Yeah. And, and it's an, it, it was a very interesting exercise. And for me, given what I do and the way I like to think about these things, that combination of place with people, it's, it kind of was a full circle for me after writing about the women mm -hmm. in The Earth in Her Hands. So. Yeah. Wonderful. And, and we can just let everybody in on a little bit of our discussion that we, we, we would like Jennifer to do a webinar about based on this book um, at, at some point in the near future. So, you know, watch this space, everybody, because um, we would like to revisit and, and, and talk about that. Um, Jennifer, do you have, um, do you have a slide with your, with your um, details and podcast on or not? So people, if people, if not, if um, not, you know, I'm if, a terrible marketer here. Wait, we'll go. Marketer. We'll go back to this one. Yeah. That yeah. one. Yeah, if you go to cult cultivatingplace.com, um, but uh, the podcast is available anywhere you get your normal podcasts. Yeah. So if people haven't listened to, because I think the wonderful thing is that, um, you know, you're, you're, when you when you're interviewing people, um, you are you you know, it's almost like putting the book in into reality. You're drawing out so much about the people, which is wonderful as well. Somebody was commenting about the photography, and I have to agree, it's a beautiful looking book. Um, oh, thank you. Because I think every every photograph. There's, I mean, I know you know, obviously yeah. you weren't traveling around taking the photographs, but they're so well chosen. I mean, I can hold it up. I mean, they're, they're so well chosen that the the um, I'll just find, let's see, the, well, we've seen the one of Marina, but um, everybody that you are, uh, you know, speaking to, there's this wonderful connection, like the one of Leslie Bennett, you know, you, you're kind of, you look like you, you know, she's just staring down the lens talking to you. Yeah. Which is great. And so it is a beautiful book and I would recommend it. It's also the most extraordinary um, um, research material for us because we could, we, could, we could have all of these women over the next 10 years talking about what they do and it would be wonderful. We could just get so, you know, get really carried away. Um, so there's lots of lovely comments which we will copy and let you have. Yeah, we'll the chat, yes. Yeah, um, there is, yeah, there are just lots of wonderful comments. I don't think there's anybody asking any particular questions other than wonderful, amazing, 
there's a very lovely um, comment from Jenny Harris saying, I'm so happy for this. One year ago, Jennifer was scheduled to speak at our little community doing a book launch tour. Of course, it was cancelled. Um, we all have so much to learn and be inspired by. I find Jennifer's book, broadcast, podcast in a general way in the world as a person to be prompting and provoking a fire, tears and inspiration and hope. And the oh. feeling of not being alone, which I think is so important. Yes. Thank you so much. So, yeah, I think, I think you know, I couldn't have put it better myself, Jenny. Thank you. <laughs> yes, um, right. And I, I talk to a lot of men, too. So just, just yeah, say, yeah, I'm an equal opportunity podcaster. <laughs> and then Bernie Haydock, who's in Ireland. Really interesting perspective. I recognize some Irish women in the audience this evening. Lynn Hughes and Riona Flannery um, and myself. Wonderful to have that you've included Fanula Fallon. Um, yeah, yeah. So just lots of lovely comments and understandably, you. but you know, if people want a really good read and 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 it is illuminating, just please do. And it's Timber Press. Um, fabulous, fabulous book. Well, and I, I was happy with the photography. I think the I think, you know, I keep I talk so much about the philosophy and the the implications and the cultural, but the fact is like we we are we're they're all there because they love gardening they love yeah. plants they love the land and and that's why i'm here and and that's you know i think why like and that's our greatest strength i think as gardeners and that's where we can actually make the greatest impact is that there's such joy in this work when we go out into the garden at 9 a.m and then 4 p.m realize that we're supposed to go inside <laughs> and where did you put your coffee cup yeah, by the yeah. way yeah 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 and and you don't have to name names but did anybody refuse to be in the book nobody refused but i had several women that had to decline because the interview process was so uh ex 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 you know exhausting and and one of them was sort of an interesting story she's a tenured professor at the university of california uh davis um an ethnobotanist very highly uh, acclaimed and she got back to me and she said, you know, I'm so sorry to have to decline, but I've just taken early retirement in order to take care of my um, early onset Alzheimer mother. Oh, right. Yeah. And yeah. I thought to myself at the time, like this right here is an illustrating story because how many men in our world would we hear that same from in that position in their career mm -hmm. and and you know and again i'm not trying to be hard on men i actually know a man i'm partnered to a man who did that very thing but i think as a culture it was just it was really interesting to me how many of our gender roles are still alive and well mm -hmm. sometimes because we want them to be mm -hmm. but what that means to us as a whole is an interesting mm. uh, an interesting thing to think about yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the whole gender and horticulture and diversity in horticulture are, are vast subjects that, you know, are, are, need to be explored more and more. And I don't know if we'll ever get to the bottom of either of them, really. But, um, you know, I think I think certainly in, in the book you do, you do, you know, we, we're on the way, we're <laughs> which is amazing. So I think, Jennifer, we will have to say thank you. And and I know we could talk about we could go through the book woman by woman. Um, but it's been wonderful. And I was just thinking actually, if it hadn't been for COVID, you know, we wouldn't be sat here chatting to you now, really. So it's kind of all of those things that you just mm -hmm. think, you know, it's it's exciting that we've we've made connections how we have over the last year uh, through something that's been pretty awful for everybody but this is the good side and and at least you know when you're reading something like your book you can escape into these people's lives and you can you can see and obviously with your podcast as well so who's coming up next on your on your cultivating place oh i have some great one and i have a bunch of british women coming oh, do up you? actually do you? yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, but I, I i try i try not to give away my source oh you know it's, it's a it's a it's okay mm, can you give us a hint so we can try and guess yeah uh let's see i can actually be a lot more specific than that well, you, you don't um, have to give the game away but it'd be nice to dangle. uh let's see oh i have uh claire Rattanon coming mm -hmm. up uh and i have my the photographer for under western skies and then i have uh, Claire Bowen of Honeysuckle and Hilda. And then I have a wonderful designer out of the Midwest, Kelly Norris, who has a new oh, book. Right, yeah. yeah, so yeah. that's good. Yeah. Um, and then I have a fantastic one coming up in June by a woman named Bonnie Clark, who studied the art, who is, as, is an archaeologist and studied the 
uh, Japanese internment camp gardens in the on the plains, the high plains of Colorado. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, fascinating. Mm -hmm. And she has a book out called The Solace of the Soil. And uh -huh. it's all about the range of gardens that accumulated in this in this internment camp over wow. the, the 10 years that it was or maybe six years that it was in place. Wow. Maybe even just four doesn't. Anyway, it, it's a really interesting one. So, and have you spoken to um, Sue Stewart Smith um, about her yeah. book? Yeah, so she look back. Uh, I want to say it was in. Where are we now? What day is it? We're in April. I want to say it was in February. I mm -hmm. spoke to her about um, the. My, yeah, the mind one. Yeah. So good. So interesting. Yeah. The little gardeners in our brain. If you guys haven't read the book, you got to read the book. Yeah. What reminded me of her, though, actually, was what you were talking about this. The previous woman is that Sue, um, Sue Stewart Smith mentioned a book by um, our we have a newsreader in the UK called John Snow. And I cannot mm -hmm. remember his sister's name, but she's written a book about war gardens. Yeah. Noel, can you remember her name? The uh, the author. It's 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 John Snow's sister, and she's written this book about war gardens. And mm -hmm. it was either Sue that told me I, that. I no, I, it shouldn't be too difficult to to yeah, Google. Yeah, I'll but, Google it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but you know, I mean, this wonderful web. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Listen, Jennifer, thank, well, you, thank you so, so much. much. It was really very interesting, and as I said, we we I think we certainly mine this book for a few more people to oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. good yes. good great that's the, that's the hope okay thank yeah. you so much great. really oh, thank you so much thank, thank you. you and we'll we'll see you again when you're talking about your next book well, well hopefully we'll be doing a webinar with uh, with your next book subject which would be wonderful well and maybe we just have to get together in person i don't oh, know oh listen i'm on i'm on that next plane <laughs> me, me too <laughs> All right. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks ever so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. Bye-bye.